Jack the Ripper, the alias of an unidentified serial killer who haunted the Whitechapel district of London in 1888 in a series of gruesome crimes characterized by extreme brutality and surgical mutilation. This sparked an extensive but ultimately unsuccessful manhunt and ignited a media frenzy that highlighted the stark social inequalities of Victorian London. Despite numerous subjects, ranging from medical professionals to even members of the royalty, the killer's identity remains one of the most famous unsolved mysteries in the annals of English crime. A quintessential tale from the darkest depths of Victorian London, all the way down into those dreary, damp slums where five unfortunate victims met their doom. Hello and welcome to the channel. Is it your first time here? Good to meet you, my friend. And if you're coming back, it's great to see you again. As always, thanks for joining me. Supporting the channel is as easy as watching the channel and you're already doing that. A like and subscribe also helps the algorithm. Two clicks away. Thank you in advance. And further to that, if you want to go above and beyond, a few links in the description. But before we go there, let's go back to the late 19th century and look at the mystery of Jack the Ripper. Ooh, I've been excited to do this one. Well, let's begin. Nice and relaxed, shall we? It was the mid-nineteenth century, the social fabric of London's East End, particularly the quaint parish of Whitechapel, was drastically altered by significant waves of immigration. You see, Irish immigrants initially surged into the area, followed by a substantial wave of Jewish refugees escaping pogroms in the Russian Empire and Eastern Europe from 1882 onwards. Of course, the migration dramatically swelled the population, which reached approximately 80,000 by 1888, exacerbating the already dire living conditions. Think of those slums, too many people, too much dirt, rats, fleas, everything else that comes with it. Not a nice place to be. And so we find ourselves in this district of Whitechapel, a district becoming synonymous with severe overcrowding, marked by squalid housing and deteriorating work conditions. It didn't help that the economic landscape was bleaker than ever, characterized by an expanding underclass, where survival often hinged on desperate measures. An alarming 55% of children born in the East End died before reaching the age of five years old, a stark indicator of the harsh realities of life in this area. Of course, the prevalence of poverty was so acute that many women resorted to being night walkers as a means of subsistence. Well, I'm going to have to use a few metaphorical words for YouTube, but I'm sure you get the point. Well, by October 1888, it was estimated that there were 62 brothels operating in Whitechapel, with around 1,200 women working within. Additionally, the district's common lodging houses, which housed about 8,500 people each night, were places of last resort for the city's many destitute citizens. Residents often slept in what was called coffin beds, or even on ropes that were stretched across dormitories. In fact, with those ropes, it was 
kind of a standing bed. You would lean yourself over this dirty old rope next to the rest of the poor and try to get a little bit of shut-eye. How successful this was. Well, maybe you can run the experiment at home. Well, and all of this was certainly a testament to the extreme living conditions faced by many, despite the British Empire being as prosperous as ever. While the decline was also accompanied by the escalating social tensions and frequent public disturbances that go hand in hand with poverty and bleak opportunities. From 1886 to 89, the area of the East End, and Whitechapel in particular, witnessed numerous demonstrations that often ended in violent clashes with the police, including the infamous Bloody Sunday in 1887, a topic for another video that is coming up shortly. Well, such unrest was combined with a great deal of anti-Semitism, crime, nativism, it all contributed to this pervasive view of Whitechapel as a notorious den of immorality and lawlessness. London itself was a den of its own, but Whitechapel was the den at the back of the den, the basement of the already dirty, decrepit house. The perception was further cemented in the public's mind in 1888 when the gruesome murders of our character for today, Jack the Ripper, began to dominate this media coverage. You can imagine what it did to the property prices. I hope you didn't buy in Whitechapel, that's for sure. Well, the sensational reporting on these horrific crimes not only showed the rampant violence, but also this profound social and economic challenge that faced Whitechapel's diverse population. A collective struggle, and the sensational events of the time, painted a grim picture of life, in a place where many people came to escape the horribleness of their old one. They found themselves in a whole new pigsty. Well, the period of the Whitechapel murders, spanning from 1888 to 91, was marked by an alarming spate of violent attacks against women, leading to a significant investigation by the Metropolitan Police. These murders, totaling 11, introduced considerable uncertainty regarding the number of victims attributed to a single assailant widely known as Jack the Ripper and I'll explain why we arrive at the figure of five. So, the police investigation categorized these murders under the umbrella of Whitechapel murders, because they were all in Whitechapel. Makes sense. However, there is debate among scholars and criminologists about whether all of these cases should be linked to one individual which we arrive at the most commonly accepted subset of these, which is referred to as the Canonical Five, believed by many experts to have been committed by the same person, distinguished by their brutal nature, and also the specific patterns of the injuries themselves. These five murders involved horrific details, such as deep cuts to the throat, extensive mutilation of the abdomen and lower areas, removal of internal organs, and progressive facial mutilations. I won't be showing those pictures for obvious reasons, but there's some rather gruesome ones if you uh, want to look them up yourself. Well, these distinct and gruesome methods form what is recognized as the modus operandi for Jack the Ripper. The first two cases in the canonical five, those of Emma Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tabram, however, 
are generally not included in the canonical group. Emma Elizabeth Smith was attacked early in the morning on April 3rd, 1888, in Osborne Street, Whitechapel. She suffered severe injuries from being bludgeoned and was essayed with a blunt object, leading to fatal peritonitis. Smith claimed that she was attacked by multiple assailants, a narrative that is inconsistent with the lone assailant theory associated with the Ripper murders. This, combined with her statement that their attackers were a small group of men, possibly a gang, leads most scholars to classify her murder as unrelated to Jack the Ripper, attributing it instead to the pervasive gang violence of the time, which was, well, it was everywhere. Now on to Martha Tabram, her murder on August the 7th, 1888. It was equally violent, but distinct in methodology. She was found with 39 stab wounds, inflicted by a bladed instrument like a penknife, targeting her vital organs and involving additional mutilations. Unlike the canonical Ripper victims, Tabram did not have her throat slashed, nor her abdomen extensively mutilated, which differentiates her case from those attributed to Jack the Ripper. Despite the savagery of her murder, and its proximity in time and location to the Ripper killings, the lack of consistent wound patterns leads many experts to exclude her from Ripper's list of victims as well. So, what about the actual victims? Well, let's discuss in detail these so-called canonical five. We'll start with Mary Ann Nichols. We'll go chronologically. So, Mary Ann Nichols, one of the canonical five victims, was found deceased around 3.40 a.m., on Friday the 31st of August, 1888, on Bucks Row, present-day Durwood Street in the Whitechapel area. She was last observed approximately an hour prior by Miss Emily Holland, with whom Nichols had previously shared accommodation in a common lodging house on Thrall Street, Spitalfields, as she walked towards Whitechapel Road. The autopsy revealed that her throat had two deep cuts, one with slicing through all the tissues down to the vertebrae. Additionally, her lower torso was stabbed twice, and a deep, jagged gash partially opened her lower abdomen, causing her bowels to protrude. Further examination showed several other cuts on both sides of her abdomen, each inflicted with a downward thrust, all from what was determined to be the same knife. A week following Mary Ann Nichols' murder, on the morning of September 8th, 1888, Annie Chapman was found deceased near the doorway in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street in Spitalfields. Echoing the murder of Nichols, Chapman had sustained two severe cuts to her throat. Her abdomen was entirely exposed, with parts of her stomach tissue deliberately placed on her left shoulder, and additional tissue along with her small intestines strategically positioned above her right shoulder. The autopsy further revealed that her uterus and parts of her bladder had been excised. At the inquiry into Chapman's death, a witness named Elizabeth Long recounted seeing Chapman around 5.30 a.m. That day, standing outside 29 Hanbury Street in the presence of a 
dark-haired man clad in brown deerstalker hat and dark overcoat, presenting a somewhat neglected yet genteel appearance. Long overheard the man query Chapman with, Will you? To which he responded affirmatively, Yes. On the early morning of Sunday, September 30th, 1888, the lives of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes were brutally cut short. Stride's body was discovered around 1 a.m. in Dutfield's yard off Burner Street, which is now Henrik Street in Whitechapel. The fatal wound was a single, precise slash across her neck that severed her left carotid artery and trachea, terminating beneath her right jaw. The absence of further mutilations on Stride's body has sparked discussions. Whether Jack was her assailant or perhaps he was interrupted mid-act and couldn't finish the job, as it seems. While well, eyewitness accounts reported seeing Stride accompanied by a man near Burner Street late on September 29th and into the early hours of the next day, though their descriptions varied significantly. Some described the man as fair, others as dark. Some noted he appeared poorly dressed, while others thought he looked well-dressed. And then there was Catherine Eddowes's body, which was discovered in Mitre Square in the city of London, approximately forty-five minutes after Elizabeth Stride's body had been found. Eddowes suffered extensive mutilations. Her throat was cut from ear to ear, abdomen opened by a deep, jagged wound, and once again the intestines were draped over her right shoulder, with part of her intestines detached and placed between her body and left arm. Her left kidney and a significant portion of her uterus were also removed. Her face was gruesomely disfigured, her nose cut off, a cheek slashed, and her eyelids were each incised with vertical cuts. Additionally, triangular incisions were made on her cheeks, pointing towards her eyes, and part of the auricle lobe of her right ear was later found in the pocket of her clothing. The police surgeon who examined the body estimated that the mutilations took at least five minutes to perform. Now, there was an account from a local cigarette salesman, Joseph Lowend, who reported seeing a fair-haired, medium-built, shabbily-dressed man with a woman who might have been Eddowes just before her murder as he passed by a church passage leading to Mitre Square. However, Lowend's companions could not confirm his account. The murders of Stride and Eddowes are collectively referred to as the Double Event. Now later, part of Eddowes's bloodied apron was found near the entrance of a tenement on Goulston Street in Whitechapel, along with a chalk-written message above it, which read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Known as the Goulston Street Graffito, its connection to the murders remains ambiguous, and it was feared that it could incite anti-Semitic reactions. Consequently, the police commissioner, Sir Charles Warren, ordered the message to be washed away immediately. Of course, if you're trying to set a group of people up, well, that's a bloody good way to do it, isn't it? Bloody good way, not a, not a good choice of words. You know what I mean. So no wonder they washed it away. If word got around of that, well, you can imagine it would have been quite a riot. 
Now, Mary Jane Kelly's body was found on her bed at 13 Millers Court, Spitalfields, at 10.45 a.m. on Friday the 9th of November, 1888. Her mutilation was by far the most severe of Ripper's alleged victims, as her face was hacked beyond recognition. Her throat was cut all the way down to the spine, and nearly every single one of her organs were removed, and for some reason he had disturbingly rearranged them around the room, with her uterus, kidneys, and one breast placed under her head, and other beside her foot and some on a bedside table. But the one thing they did not find was her heart, which was missing from the scene. So, he's obviously taken it with him, hasn't he? A kind of grim souvenir. Well, evidence within the room suggested that the killer had set a fire in the fireplace, likely to illuminate the room while he carried out the gruesome act. The intensity of the fire was enough to melt the solder of a kettle which was in the fireplace at the time. All of the canonical five murders occurred at night, near weekends, and typically towards the end of the month, or about a week thereafter. As the sequence of murders unfolded, the severity of the mutilations also escalated, except in the case, of course, of Elizabeth Stride, where it's assumed that the killer must have been scared off by something. Now, Mary Ann Nichols' body showed no organs removed. Annie Chapman had her uterus and parts of her bladder taken. Catherine Eddowes had her uterus and left kidney removed, and her face mutilated. And Mary Jane Kelly's body was the worst of all, horrifically eviscerated, with her face severely slashed, and her neck tissue cut down to the bone with her heart being the only organ completely missing from the scene. While the prevailing historical view that these five murders were committed by the same individual stems from the documents from the time that consistently link these specific crimes together. A few years later, in 1894, Sir Melville McNaughton, assistant chief constable of the Metropolitan Police and head of the Criminal Investigation Department, explicitly stated in a report that the Whitechapel murderer had five victims and five victims only. This viewpoint was supported in a letter written on the 10th of November 1888 by a police surgeon named Thomas Bond, addressed to Robert Anderson, the head of London CID, Criminal Investigation Division, which also linked these five murders together. But of course, some researchers do suggest that while a single killer was likely responsible for several of the murders, other killings may have been perpetuated by different individuals acting independently. Authors Stuart P. Evans and Donald Rumbelow questioned the Ripper myth, as they call it, proposing that only the murders of Nichols, Chapman, and Eddowes can be definitively connected to one perpetrator, with less certainty surrounding the murders of Stride and Kelly. Others suggest that all six murders from Martha Tabron to Kelly, were the works of the same killer. Now, an assistant to the examining pathologist George Baxter, one named F Percy Clark, rather, believed that the only three of the murders were connected, suggesting that the others might have been committed by what he called weak-minded individuals induced to emulate the crime somewhat macabrely inspired by the Ripper's work to go out on their own and commit some terrible crimes. 
now notably McNaughton's 1894 memorandum, which plays a significant role in shaping the narrative of the Ripper that we've ended up with in our modern day, contains several factual inaccuracies and was written after he joined the police force, a year following the murders, so he didn't get in till 1889. Now, here's another one. Rose Millet, age 26, was found deceased in Clark's Yard, High Street, on December 20th, 1888. There were no indications of struggle at this scene, leading police to theorize that she might have accidentally strangled herself with her collar during a drunken stupor, or perhaps she had just taken her own life, which was, of course, an issue in those kind of conditions. However, the presence of faint cord markings on one side of her neck did suggest strangulation. The inquest jury ultimately ruled her death a murder. And then there was Alice Mackenzie slain shortly after midnight on July 17, 1889, in Castle Alley, Whitechapel. She suffered two stab wounds to her neck, severing her left carotid artery, alongside several minor bruises and a superficial seven-inch wound from her left breast to her navel. The case was contentious among the examining pathologists. Thomas Bond considered it a Ripper-related murder, whereas George Bagster, who had examined three previous victims, had a complete disagreement on this. Opinions among the researchers remained divided, with some suggesting the murderer emulated the Ripper's methods to deflect suspicion, while others believe it was indeed the work of the Ripper. And think about it, if they're out looking for the one guy, well, if they catch him, they're going to pin your murders on him as well. I'm sure that all the psychos of the time who were out attacking helpless women saw this as a kind of get-out-of-jail-free card. Now, here's another one for you. I know that the murders just keep coming, but we got to talk about all of them. They all contribute to this overall context of the time. One called the Pynchon Street Torso involved the discovery of a decomposing, headless and legless torso of an unidentified woman, estimated to be between 30 and 40 years old, found beneath a railway arch in Pynchon Street, Whitechapel, September 10th, 1889. Evidence of extensive beating and mutilation of the abdomen were noted. It is believed that the body parts were transported and hidden under an old chemise. Francis Coles was also discovered at 2.15 a.m., February 13th, 1891, beneath a railway arch at Swallow Gardens, Whitechapel. Her throat had been deeply cut, but unlike the other Ripper victims, her body showed no signs of mutilation, suggesting her assailant might have been interrupted. Coles was found alive, but succumbed to her injuries before medical assistance could arrive. James Thomas Sadler, who had been seen with Coles and argued with her hours before her death, was arrested and charged with her murder. Well, it was initially suspected that he was the Ripper, but he was later released due to insufficient evidence. Which is probably surprising, being in 1891. Yes, they did have rule of law, they did have lawyers, and, well, if they couldn't get evidence on you, well, they had to let you go. So, what about the police? 
They certainly had their work cut out for them. And think about it, they didn't really have much to work with at the time. The technology wasn't there, and, well, it was pretty hard to find a murderer back in those days. The majority of the City of London police records pertaining to the Whitechapel murders investigation were actually destroyed during the Second World War Blitz. Fires from those German bombers overhead. Which is a shame. However, the documents that we do have from the Metropolitan Police provide a comprehensive insight into the investigative methods used in the Victorian era. A significant effort involving house-to-house -house inquiries, old-fashioned door-knocking was made throughout Whitechapel, where forensic evidence was collected and suspects were identified and scrutinized further or completely cleared, depending on which one came first. This methodical approach is akin to modern investigative techniques. We still have interviews, we still have to talk to people, gather evidence, see if they slip up in the interview or say something that contradicts something else. And it was just the same for the police back then in London, trying to figure out what was going on. Well, throughout the course of the investigation, over 2,000 individuals were interviewed. More than 300 were investigated in depth, and 80 of them were detained. After the murders of Stride and Eddowes, the commissioner of the city police, Sir James Fraser, offered a £500 reward for information that led to the Ripper's capture. The initial investigation was led by the Metropolitan Police's Whitechapel Division Criminal Investigation Department, under Detective Inspector Edmund Reed. Following the murder of Mary Ann Nichols, Detective Inspectors Frederick Aberlin and Henry Moore, along with Walter Andrews from the Central Office at Scotland Yard, were dispatched to assist. The City of London Police joined the investigation under Detective Inspector James McWilliam after Catherine Eddowes was murdered within their very jurisdiction. The investigation's overall coordination suffered while the CID's newly appointed head, Robert Anderson, was on leave in Switzerland from early September to early October coinciding with the murders of Chapman, Stride, and Eddowes. Bad time to take a holiday. Well, this led to Colonel Sir Charles Warren, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, to appoint Chief Inspector Donald Swanson to oversee the inquiry from Scotland Yard. Now, given the nature of the mutilations, butchers, slaughterers, surgeons and physicians were initially suspected. A list had been made, and they were going to interview all of them. A note from one Major Henry Smith, the acting commissioner of the city police, mentioned that the alibis of local butchers and slaughterers were thoroughly checked and subsequently cleared. Inspector Swanson reported to the Home Office that 76 butchers and slaughterers, along with their employees from the past six months, were investigated. Some notable contemporaries, including Queen Victoria, speculated that the killer could be a butcher or cattle drover from the cattle boats that frequented the London docks near Whitechapel. These boats typically docked on Thursdays or Fridays, and left over the weekend. However, they couldn't find any correlation between the murder dates and the movements of any single cattle boat, nor was there any evidence of crewmen transferring between boats, so that theory was rather disappointingly put to bed. But they were certainly on to something. It just didn't lead anywhere. But of course, 
It wasn't just the police looking for this murderer. The people in Whitechapel weren't awfully keen on allowing this kind of behaviour to continue at their doorstep. In response to the ongoing murders and growing dissatisfaction with the police's inability to capture the killer, the community members of London's East End formed what would be known as the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee in September of 1888. This group of volunteer citizens took to the streets, patrolling for suspicious individuals. Their motivation stemmed not only from the apparent ineffectiveness of the police response, but also from concerns that the murders were negatively impacting local businesses. Think about it. No one's going to head into Whitechapel for their evening piano lesson, or whatever they had going on there at that night, uh, if there's a murderer on the loose. It's bad for business. Foot traffic is important. You know this. While the committee actively sought to influence the outcome of the investigation by petitioning the government to offer a reward for information that could lead to the killer's arrest. Now, Additionally, they were offering their own reward, £50, which was a pretty significant sum at the time. And to further their efforts, they employed private detectives to independently interrogate witnesses, indicating a profound level of community involvement and initiative in an era marked by limited police resources and investigative techniques. And think about it. It's a very good thing that they banded together. Because, as we've mentioned, the little message written about the Jews, well, a lot of the Whitechapel area was different immigrants, some from Russia, some from Ireland, and the local British. It would have been very, very easy for these three groups to blame it on a member of the other group. And we all know what's going to happen then. Far better off that they all get together and rally to find this common menace. Would have been a very different story if they didn't. Well, at the end of October, Robert Anderson, a senior police official, enlisted Thomas Bond, a police surgeon, to evaluate the surgical skills and knowledge of the Whitechapel murderer. Bond's analysis, which is considered the earliest surviving criminal profile, was informed by his examination of the most brutally mutilated victim, along with the post-mortem reports of the previous four canonical victims. He concluded that all five murders were likely committed by the same individual. Bond noted that in the first four cases, the victim's throats were cut from left to right, and while the extensive mutilations in the last murder made it impossible to determine the direction of the fatal cut, arterial splashes found near the victim's head suggested a similar method. Bond suggested that all victims were likely attacked while lying down, starting with their throats being cut. Contrary to some theories, he argued that the murderer did not possess any scientific, anatomical, or professional knowledge of butchery. Instead, he suggested that the killer was likely a solitary figure suffering from periodical attacks of homicidal and erotic mania, hinting at a possible condition like satyriasis. He also speculated that the motive could stem from a revengeful or brooding condition of the mind or religious mania, though he found these theories a little less convincing. The case's psychological aspect is highlighted by experts who believe that the nature of the attacks, stabbing the victims and positioning them in degrading manners, 
suggests that the killer derived some kind of sick sexual pleasure from the act. However, this is an interpretation that is not universally accepted, with some dismissing it as uh, speculative. While efforts to definitively identify the killer are admittedly complicated by the unreliability of accounts from the time and lack of concrete forensic evidence, contemporary analysis of letters possibly left by the killer have been hindered by the extensive contamination and handling over the years, rendering DNA tests inconclusive. Claims attributing the definitive DNA evidence to specific subjects, such as the Whitechapel barber Aaron Kosminski, or the artist Walter Sickert, have also faced criticism over the validity of the scientific methods used, showing once again the ongoing challenges and controversies in resolving this whole situation. But the pattern of the murders, predominantly occurring on weekends and public holidays and within that confined geographical area, suggests to many experts that the killer was likely employed locally and carried out the attacks during his off hours. But this theory does contrast sharply with another school of thought that proposes that the river might have been an educated, upper-class individual, such as a doctor or even an aristocrat, that ventured into Whitechapel from a more affluent area. This latter theory taps into historical fears of the medical profession and a broader societal anxiety about the exploitation of the poor by the wealthy. The fascination with uncovering the Ripper's identity led to the emergence of what is called Ripperology, a field dedicated to studying the, and analysing rather, the case to solve the mystery. And I suppose that's what we're doing right now, right? Well, the Ripper case has not only inspired a host of fictional accounts, I'm sure you know, but also a wide range of speculative theories about the identity of the killer. And I will say, if I am going to make a recommendation, that perhaps you shouldn't take too seriously on a historical basis, watch the movie From Hell. It's quite a, quite a good film. But don't come at me saying that it's not historically accurate. It's a movie. Just enjoy it for what it is. And have fun. Well, over the years, numerous individuals have been proposed as suspects, ranging from those mentioned in contemporary documents to various well-known figures who were never considered by the original investigators such as, get this, Prince Albert Victor and even the author Lewis Carroll. That's right, that Lewis Carroll. While the lack of definitive historical evidence allows modern writers to be, well, a little bit silly with their speculations. I mean, Lewis Carroll, that's very far-fetched. Well, among the suspects, highlighted in historical police documents, getting back to reality for a little bit for a moment, notably Sir Melville McNaughton's 1894 memorandum, none have been conclusively linked with the crimes, with the evidence against them being purely circumstantial at best, and completely ridiculous at worst. Today, we've got a list of over 100 potential suspects. And who knows, maybe the real Ripper is not even on that list. Well, during the murders, the police, newspapers, and various individuals received letters related to the case. And quite a few of them. 
while some letters offered well-meaning advice on how to capture the killer. The majority were either hoaxes or just of no practical use. There were a few of them, though, that are considered from the Ripper himself, and I will get to read all of them in a moment, but let's just cover them briefly first, and then we'll go and read the source material. Among all of these correspondences, hundreds claim to be penned by the killer himself. Three letters in particular stand out for their notoriety. The Dear Boss Letter, the Saucy Jack Postcard, and the From Hell Letter. The Dear Boss Letter, dated September 25th and postmarked September 27th, 1888, was initially sent to the Central News Agency and subsequently forwarded to Scotland Yard on September 29th. Originally dismissed as a hoax, the letter gained serious attention after the murder of Catherine Eddowes. You see, Eddowes was found with one of her ears partially cut off, eerily reflecting the letter's threat to clip the lady's ears off. However, the promise to send the ears to the police was never fulfilled, and it's believed that the cutting of the ear was an accidental result of the attack, not deliberate as the letter had suggested. The letter is famously noted for introducing the world to the name Jack the Ripper. Now, following the Dear Boss letter, many subsequent letters mimicked its tone, and some authors even adopted monikers like George of the High Rip Gang, Jack Sheridan the Ripper. There is some debate over an earlier letter dated September 17, 1888, which also purported to use the name Jack the Ripper. However, many experts consider this earlier reference a 20th century fabrication added to the police record, and thus not authentic. And then we have the Saucy Jack postcard, which was postmarked on October the 1st, 1888, arriving at the Central News Agency the same day. The handwriting on the postcard was similar to that of the Dear Boss letter, and reference the double murder that occurred on September 30th, which it chillingly described as the double event this time. Initially, the timing of the postcard's dispatch led some to speculate that it was sent before the details of the murders became widely known, suggesting genuine knowledge of the crimes. However, the postcard was sent more than 24 hours after the murders, by which time the details were already public knowledge, and the subject of extensive journalistic coverage and, of course, local gossip. Now, there was another notable correspondence, the From Hell letter, which was received by George Lusk, the leader of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee on the 16th of October, 1888. Unlike the earlier communications, the handwriting and style differed significantly. This letter was disturbingly accompanied by a small box containing half of a human kidney preserved in ethanol. This grim token was partially significant because the killer had removed the left kidney from the victim Catherine Eddowes, the letter's author gruesomely claimed to have eaten the other half of it. The authenticity of the kidney as belonging to Eddowes has been disputed, with some suggesting it as a ghastly prank. Although Thomas Oppenshaw at the London Hospital examined the kidney and confirmed it was human and from the left side, though we could not determine any definitive biological characteristics beyond that. That's just the way it was for the time. In an attempt to identify the writer, Scotland Yard published facsimiles of both the 
Dear Boss Letter in the Saucy Jack Postcard on October 3rd, hoping that somebody might recognize the handwriting. Despite doubts about their authenticity, police were compelled to investigate all leads. The skepticism around these letters was compounded when Charles Warren, in correspondence with Godfrey Lushington, expressed his belief that they were hoaxes, but acknowledged the necessity of pursuing every potential clue. They also didn't have much else to go on. They had to do something, I'm sure. Of course, the journalistic angles of these letters was underscored when George R. Sims suggested in an October 7, 1888 article that a journalist had simply made them up to dramatically increase newspaper sales. And this suspicion was seemingly confirmed decades later when Fred Best, a journalist with The Star, reportedly admitted that he and a colleague had concocted the letters attributed to Jack the Ripper to maintain public interest in the story and boost newspaper circulation. But, once again, that is not quite proven. People can say things for all sorts of reasons. And if not just for the pure interest of it. We're going to read the letters out. So the first one is the Dear Boss letter, as from the 25th of September, 1888, and it goes like this. Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about the leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on whores, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You'll soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with it, but it went thick like glue, and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. The next job I shall clip the lady's ears off, and send to the police officers, just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp. I want to get to work right away, if... I get the chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving my trade name. Oh, P.S. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands, curse it. No luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. <laughs> and the next letter. From October the 1st. 1888. This is the Saucy Jack postcard. It's short and sweet compared to the first one. I was not cutting dear old boss when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jack's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit. Couldn't finish straight off. Had not time to get the ears off for police. Thanks for keeping the last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. And the next one is the From Hell letter. From the 15th of October, 1888. Some two weeks later. From Hell. Mr. Lusk. Sir, I send you... Half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you, the other piece. I fried and ate, it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out, if you would only wait a while longer. Signed, Catch Me When You Can, Mr. Lusk.
Now, the Jack the Ripper case marked a significant turning point in how crime was reported in the media, being the first to ignite a global media frenzy. The phenomenon was partly fueled by the increase in literacy among the working class, a result of the Elementary Education Act of 1880, which made school attendance compulsory across all social classes in England and Wales, a massive step forward. By 1888, a larger segment of the population could read, increasing the audience for printed media. And most houses had a literate person in there. So if you couldn't read, you could ask somebody for help. Additionally, tax reforms in the 1850s had made it possible to publish inexpensive newspapers, leading to a boom in the industry. By the late Victorian era, the proliferation of mass circulation newspapers, some costing as little as a half penny, along with popular magazines like the Illustrated Police News, provided the Ripper case with unprecedented publicity, which, in a very grim way, may have encouraged him. At the peak of the investigation, the daily newspaper sales exceeded one million copies, though the reporting was often sensationalistic and speculative, with frequent inaccuracies presented as facts. I suppose some things about the media never change. Well, the media's coverage also played into the local xenophobic sentiments, with numerous articles suggesting that the Ripper was either Jewish or just a foreigner. The frenzy was exemplified by the response to the murder of Mary Ann Nichols. Just six days after her death, the Manchester Guardian rather rudely reported on the police's secretive handling of the information, which of course frustrated journalists and led to speculative and often inaccurate reporting. The press even created elaborate profiles of suspects like Leather Apron, John Pizer, a local Jew that worked with Leather, whose arrest was based on completely groundless suspicions, though he was later released after verifying his alibis. The publication of Dear Boss Letter shifted public attention and the press quickly adopted the moniker Jack the Ripper for the killer, replacing the leather apron. I suppose it's a much more catchy name. Also, it took the heat off the other guy, didn't it? Well, this name linked the case to the mythical figure of Spring-Heeled Jack, a purported attacker known for his ability to leap over walls and frighten people. The use of such nicknames became a standard practice in media coverage of similar cases, beginning the trend and leading to naming of various other serial killers inspired by the Ripper moniker. Of course, that continues all the way to this day. Well, thank you very much for listening. I hope that was all you thought it was going to be. No nightmares now. I'd like to thank my top tier patrons, Brit, Charles, Stark Factory, JC, Jeffrey, Wendy, Tim, James, Aaron, Scott, Dark, and Ben. Thank you very much. And thank you, dear listener, for getting this far in the video. I'm sure it's been interesting for you if you've stayed this long, and there's plenty more where that came from. But perhaps not as macabre as today's episode, unless that's what you're into. Good night, everyone. Lots of love to you all. <laughs>